Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we are back looking at the suggestions passed to developers of May 2020, and after having a look at the mechanics parts and also the aviations parts, now it's time to have a look at the ground forces. And where to start but America? It's time to have a look at a post by CK16 looking at the M3A2 Bradley. Obviously this would be an upgraded version of the one that we already have in game, and definitely one that a lot of people have been looking looking forward to. So what are the specific upgrades when it comes uh, to the Bradley, which, you know, we have in game compared to this one? So uh, the general changes are the original Space Laminus armor. It was replaced by two plates of one and one and a quarter inch steel armor, and this ran the length of the hull on both sides of the Bradley. Also, in addition to this, a reactive armor in the uh, form of, of course, ERA uh, would be or could be fitted uh, to increase survivability against shaped charge weapons. Armor plates uh, would also have been added to the front of the hull, eliminating the trim vein carried by the M2, M3 and the M2A1 and the M3A1. The armored plates would also to be added to the turret for increased protection. Hopefully the uh, image that you can see here gives you a general idea of the changes uh, between the two vehicles. There was also uh, the gun shroud around the 7.6 to uh, coaxial machine gun was deleted and a pair of smoke grenade stowage boxes were installed on the turret under the gun mantlet. These boxes were smaller and narrower than the stowage boxes used on the earlier M2 M3 and also uh, the rigid Kevlar blankets were added to the vehicle which would act as spore liners which of course would reduce the amount of armor spalling or if the machine was penetrated, reduce the general spalling of the rounds coming in compared to, you know, what was going on. Now, obviously the external stuff was changed, as we can see here and what we've gone through, but it wasn't just that. There was a bunch of other ideas which were also changed, which include uh, included where the actual um, the crew would be seated. So combat loaded, uh, one of the things on top of what we were also talking about is the fact that the M2A2 and the M2A2 would be about 30 tons, but this increased to approximately 33 tons if they added the additional armor tile kit, which was the ERA we mentioned before. So what this meant is, well, that's three extra tons. You need to try and be able to put enough power in the machine to be able to combat that. And uh, so they decided to add the Cummins uh, VTA903T diesel engine, which developed 600 gross horsepower and this was coupled to the improved HMPT 503 transmission and this powertrain meant that the maximum speed was 35 miles per hour on roads and also 4 miles per hour in water uh, so this was able to move around the place then there was so this was the general you know M3A2 and then the M3A2 went through a bunch of additions on top of that uh, see these as kind of variants built onto the variants so after the live fire testing now of the m3a2 and uh, they decided to do some evaluations of improvements and the test program also included a so-called minimum casualty version of the vehicle and what this meant is uh, the vehicle stowed uh, much of the fuel and the ammunition outside of the crew compartments to try and protect them from secondary fires and general explosions. And uh, during the results of the live fire test in the 80s, this meant that more modifications of the M2A2 and the M3A2 went forward. The seating was rearranged in the squad compartment and the vehicle was restowed uh, to reduce the vulnerability. In the M2A2, the two observers were moved to a bench seat on the left side of the squad compartment, as you can see in this picture. And now, of course, uh, after all of the testing and all of the improving and all of the modifications, the real test for any of these vehicles is, of course, when they go into combat. So then, that brings us on to the M3A2 ODS upgrade. This is technically the Operation Desert Storm upgrade, obviously, meaning ODS. 
and this was uh, several field modifications or retrofits to the Bradley to make it better for the conditions that it found itself in. These modifications were uh, stuff like iSafe carbon dioxide laser rangefinder being added, a GPS being added, driver's thermal viewer as well, and also missile countermeasure devices. And with these changes, the vehicles were also designated as the M2A2 ODS and the M3A2 ODS. Now, I did keep the Bushmaster, the M242 uh, 25mm, obviously has a range of about 2,000 meters and a standard fire rate of around 200 rounds per minute. The main ammunition being used, or at least will be used in game, being the APDS and also the HIT, plus some APFSDS, uh, which was used um, uh, 1986 plus. So, if they wanted to put in a really modern version of this Bradley in the form of the M3A2, it could definitely get some APFSDS absolutely rocketing around the place. And obviously, uh, with looking at the munitions, the one thing that we must note is, of course, the uh, main armament I think a lot of people would see which would, of course, be the tow launcher. Now, the tow launcher uh, on the M3A2 was mainly designed to fire the tow 2 ATGM, and these are all the TOW 2 ATGMs, or just basically the TOWs in general that you can see in this picture. And the BGM uh, 71 TOW, uh, which was a heavy tank missile, was developed by Hughes Aircraft Company during the mid and late 60s, and it was designed both for ground and heliborne uh, applications. And the production contract was awarded in 68, first fielded in 1970, and the TOW was one of the most widely used um, anti tank missiles in the world. When it comes to the M3A2, uh, what is being proposed in this past to developers article is the use of the TOW 2 on the um, on the Bradley itself. So the TOW 2 is an upgraded version of the TOW. It entered service with the US Army in 1983. The weapon system is the BGM-71D missile. It has a new reusable launcher, missile guidance set, and also a sight system. The launcher is lighter. It's compatible with all previous TOW missiles, and it also has a thermal optics uh, that can be used at night, so therefore the new missile has a larger warhead with extendable probes as well as improved guidance, and the TOTO missile uh, is available in several versions, the 2A, the 2, and also the 2B, and uh, let's just say uh, many of them uh, do different things, we talked about them recently in the Swedish helicopters thing, you don't want to mess with them, uh, they'll be able to knock out pretty much anything uh, you have to deal with on the battlefield. Field. So yeah, uh, it's looking like a really cool addition. Obviously, we already have a Bradley in game, but because of the wonderful versions that are on offer for a lot of the American vehicles, it doesn't mean that that line can't grow. And it would be lovely to see another one of these about the place. Extra armor, extra engine, a little bit better crew survivability, and more firepower. Pretty much upgraded in every single way. The next thing we are having a look at is from Xenocrite, and this is the Panzer. 1B MIT 7.5cm Stuck 40L48. Now, what this is, what this is, is, uh, well, let's just call it a field modification. So, uh, obviously, at the end of the World War II, I think it's safe to say the Germans were pretty desperate uh, when it came to a lot of their ideas. What they were looking for was ways to be able to make certain chassis or certain guns more mobile, so therefore they could uh, defend the areas quicker and be able to retreat when required. And this seems to be a field modification of a Panzer 1 Aus B light tank chassis, which has on top of it a 7.5 centimeter Stuck 40 gun. Now this is the same gun that you would find on the Stug tank destroyers. So imagine taking a Stug gun and sticking it on a Panzer 1 chassis. This is pretty much what you see in this. And also, I should say that this is also believed to be a one-off field conversion that appeared late in the war. This isn't something that was widespread. It was just something that I'm guessing was tried, maybe along with the Waffentragers, or maybe out of desperation. It still would be lovely to see, and uh, it's nice to see it brought up. Maybe as a cool 
little premium. The next uh, set of vehicles is from Cade, and we're talking about the Humber Armoured Cars. And the Humber Armoured Cars are beautiful uh, little machines, if you've never seen them before. Uh, here they are in all of their wonderful glory. And what you see from the Humber Armoured Car is that it's a combination of two other ideas. Uh, the first one being the Carrier KT4 and the Guy Armoured Car. The KT4 at the time was already in production for the Indian Army, and the Guy Armoured Car was having real issues when it came to its production levels, uh, so they weren't able to make it quick enough, so they combined the two ideas, uh, created a turret, which was a two-men model, and this was inspired by the Mark VI uh, light tank, and then decided to arm it with the 15mm Bessa, uh, and then the armoured body was sloped uh, with the high driver compartment, uh, the turret and fighting compartment were at the centre, and there were also two reinforced armoured hatches on both sides. So additional storage compartments were also placed um, uh, were also placed on the fenders and behind the side of the doors and these uh, procured some extra protection and sometimes there's also a spare road wheel and all of that stuff. And the Humber is kind of a cool little armoured car because it actually went through many little variations as it went along. So the first one you had is the Humber AC Mark 1. This is the basic version. Uh, there was about 300 of them built. This is the one which just has the 15 millimeter Bessa gun on it. Then you have the Humber AC Mark 1A. This is an AA version, uh, which had access to a quad set of 7.92 millimeters, very similar to the Rank 1 AA that we see in the British tech tree. Then we have the Humber AC Mark II. This was an upgrade, which basically added um, a little bit better turret, a little bit better radiator, and also a completely redesigned front frontal glacis armor, uh, which is uh, very nice. And then the big one, which is, oh no, well, sorry, not the big one, the one that's slightly after. The Humber AC Mark III, which was a significant upgrade, it was wider, uh, rear extended turret, uh, and it was designed for three people. It was all, uh, it was designed to accommodate a wireless operator, freeing the commander from the task, and this allowed fitting heavier equipment. There was a sub variant which uh, eliminated the gun uh, to make room for an extra wireless power radio. Uh, so this probably isn't something that we're going to be in the game, but this one is probably the one which makes the most sense. It is the Humber AC Mark IV, and this is the one which was a pat which was armed with the 37 millimeter from the US, the M5 or the M6 37 millimeter. And as you can see, 2,000 uh, plus of these were produced. Uh, so this is definitely the version that I can see, you know, coming into game. And the Humber was used a lot uh, around the place. Uh, it was something which was used a lot by. By British forces. There was a nearly, there was over 5,000 of these built, and also, as you can see, the engine being only 90 horsepower, uh, it had a 12.9 uh, horsepower per ton. It was still able to motor around the place and have a bit of fun. It would be nice to see it represented in the game. The next one is an experimental vehicle, and one which has pretty much no information on it. This is the Type 98 Chi Ho, and it's being uh, put forward by Azens, and this thing uh, as you can see is well uh, <laughs> you, you know how we talk about a lot of these Japanese vehicles don't have a lot of information well look at this information so uh, let's talk I'm, I'm just going to verbatim quote the first line of this because I think it's hilarious uh, but also understand that Azens is from Japan he's not a native English speaker so please you know uh, please uh, please uh, I can't remember what the word is. Um, please, uh, you know, don't go after the general, you know, English uh, literature part of it because there's you know, obviously no need to. So Japanese tank, Japanese tanks are very mysterious. Its documents is not so much exist because in the end of the war, these documents were burned. The vehicle is the one uh, most unknown, which is the Chi Ho. So this is one of the most unknown vehicles of World War II when it comes to Japan, which is saying a lot, because there's a lot of vehicles in Japan which don't have a lot of information on them. So the project where this actually comes from is called the Chi Ni Plan, and in 1937, the Type 97 tank competition was started, and the Imperial Japanese Army General Staff uh, were looking for a cheap, lightweight, and able-to-be-mass-produced tank, and this would be called the Chi Ni, but the 
tank units, uh, which were actually on the front lines, or the tank units who were actually going to operate these vehicles, insisted they needed something with better performance. So instead, they went for Plan 1, which was the Chi Ha, which we of course see in-game. So the result of the competition was the Chi Ha was adopted because uh, they got more budget uh, because of the Japanese-China War. But however, the General Staff HQ uh, didn't throw away the plans uh, of the Chi Ha um, because uh, it was too heavy. Uh, its mass was about 15 tons, so they ordered to build the Chi Ho project. So the general idea is uh, there is a picture on this uh, if you can have a look, which is supposed to show, whoops, uh, which is supposed to show the uh, the Chi Ho right here in this picture if you can see it. And uh, generally, it would uh, pretty much be this. So known things about the Chi Ho, this is literally it. Um, the Type 98 is its uh, unofficial name. There were two prototypes built at Mitsubishi and Omori, two prototype built at Kakura and Sagami uh, Army Arsenal. Uh, the turret would be the same as the Type 97 Kai. The top board of turret is flat and the machine gun is on the left side, so it uh, didn't have a cupola. It would be armed with a 47mm tank gun. The road wheels were five on each side. Suspension system is a seesaw, so the same as the other Japanese tanks. It was fitted with a sled on the rear. Uh, and also muffler on the uh, hull rear side. The engine would be the Mitsubishi A6120 VD or the Mitsubishi SA8160 VD, an air-cooled eight-cylinder diesel engine and also hydraulic steering system. So as you can see, not a ton known about this vehicle, but at the end of the day, it would be nice to see it if more information is uncovered. The next vehicle is an abomination, and this is shown, uh, this is put forward by Condottieri, uh, or Condottiero, and uh, what this is, is another little annoying armored car. Uh, and <laughs> it's the Ferrari F333E Lizard, and it's one of those ones which, uh, if you want to have a look at some uh, pictures, this is what it would look like, and uh, generally what you are seeing. Very similar to the uh, R3 series of vehicles that we have in the game, and uh, let's just go through it. So the F333E is a, a prototype of a light armored vehicle. It never entered mass production. It was designed by Ferrari, uh, Ferrari engineers in Turin, and its mass production uh, was the idea to put forward a fast patrolling reconnaissance and support vehicle uh, for weapons and electronic means so small fast manageable and also well armed so it's a vehicle suitable for different types of terrain and slopes uh, mainly thanks to its four-wheel design uh, its construction it was steel armor uh, which was used to guarantee protection against 7.62 millimeter nato caliber rounds and the rims are fitted with run flat type goodyear tires the 250 um, liter explosion proof tanks uh, each allow a considerable autonomy 800 kilometers on the road and a thousand kilometers on rail because this thing could actually also be put on rail you could replace its wheels with railway wheels and it would be allowed to be driven around the place uh, it could go around 60 kilometers an hour mainly thanks to its low weight and dimensions it could also be dropped from low altitude or transported by a helicopter if you felt like it so Obviously, with designs like this, if you didn't know, if you have a look at like the R3s, um, which are obviously in the game, generally what you have is you have a armored car platform, uh, which, you know, is uh, basically this, and then the weapon systems come on top of it. Uh, so what you would do is you would order the platform and then order the weapon system and marry them together. So the idea of this machine is that you could have it in many different basic variants. Uh, one was a scout variant, this would have access to a roof-mounted 12.7mm machine gun with a bow 5.56. The anti-tank version of this would have a Milan ATGM 
launcher on the top of it. Then you had an anti-riot basic fighter one, which would have uh, the same bow 556 as a scout model, um, but also it would have an, an alternative as a flamethrower uh, on it, uh, so therefore you could do a bit of crowd control, which is kind of ridiculous. It also uh, may have a three-man crew and fitted only with a bow-mounted 556 machine gun. That would be its commando version. But the idea is, is you've created a little buggy here and you can pretty much put whatever you want on top of it. Uh, so this would include, uh, in, in, this would also include stuff such as the SR cannon, the Folgore, the Milan, the tow missile, the flamethrowers, and also different types of machine guns. It was just a platform you could chuck stuff on and have a bit of fun with it. So yeah, this would be a race car with a gun on it. Uh, a very, very scary little thing. The next one is from Private Woke, and we're talking about an AMX-13 DCA. So we obviously have an AMX-13 DCA in the game, and uh, the difference between it and this one is that this machine uh, would uh, would not have... Uh, the AMX-13 that we have here would have access to the 30mm Hispano Suzers, uh, HSS-831s. Obviously, they were very good good at what they were doing and then this um, Amex uh, 13 or Amex uh, 13 DCA would not have access to radar but it would have access to the upgunning abilities of the Amex 30 DCA that we have in game so it's probably best to see this thing as an Amex 30 DCA but on obviously the 13's chassis and without the radar that's about what you're looking at here so a very deadly machine uh, which could definitely fit in the um in the French tree uh, under uh, something like the AMX-30 DCA. The next one uh, is from Tasty95215, and this time we're having a look at the PVKV-4, the Varian tank, uh, or tank destroyer, I should say. This is actually a really cool vehicle. So uh, what this is is an upgunning program. The, the PVKV-4, it was an experimental Swedish tank destroyer. They uh, converted and tested it in 1952, and they general idea was to extend the life of the L60 light tank, uh, so taking its chassis and building a new gun platform on it. So they decided to use a 57mm uh, anti-tank gun in a new turret, and uh, it's just really nice uh, to see the fact that they added this thing. The uh, the SDRV M40L which was used uh, for this, it was modified to create this machine. The hull remained mostly the same, and the there was removal of the applique armor in order to keep the weight down. And the new turret was very lightly armored, between 12 millimeters all around, uh, and uh, with the exception of its gun mantlet, which would have been. 20 millimeters. The 57 millimeter would be able to fire HE, AP, HE, BC. AP and also APDS, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, but generally, what we're finding, what we're finding from this machine is if we have a look at it compared to like the PVKV3 and the PVKV2, um, it's just another one of these projects to extend the chassis life um, of these vehicles and adding bigger and better guns on them, which is pretty cool. They also had um, plans to add a coaxial machine gun to it and also a thermal sleeve on the barrel uh, pushing forward. So yeah, it would have a 57mm PV, uh, PV can uh, M43, an 8mm KSP M39, and also pretty good gun elevation and depression, plus 19, minus 14, and a rate of fire of 5 to 6 rounds per minute on that 57mm. The engine itself was the Scania Vabis 1664, gasoline 145 horsepower at 2300 RPM, could canter around at 45 kilometers an hour with a crew of three. You had the driver, the gunner machine gunner, and then the commander radio man loader so he's got a lot of jobs to do but overall yes this is another one of those projects taking an old chassis and giving it some new tricks which would be lovely to see but that is all the stuff we have available uh, for uh, this uh, past to developers a lot of very interesting stuff a lot of stuff from world war ii which is nice and also some go-karts plus of course the wonderful bradley i hope you all have a wonderful day and i'll see you next time I'd like to thank Ambrosius McClellan, B. Young, 
Battling Bacon, Blackie, Chris Giltnane, Conte Baraka, Daniel Stanton, Elov Goat, Jay Wilt, Martinez, Trigger Hippie, Universe, Eugens Terry, and also AI'm Devilish and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.